Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Hashtag NBA Together, this series of interviews in which we talk to the most influential names in the game. We began that with Adam Silver, the commissioner, and then we went to Damian Lillard after that. We went to uh, Toronto's uh, Masai Ujiri, the uh, president of the organization. Uh, we talked to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar last week. Hope you enjoyed that. And we begin this week uh, with Dirk Nowitzki, uh, now retired, uh, <laughs> now nearly 42 years old, 21 seasons, all with the Dallas Mavericks. There is nobody in NBA history who's ever played longer with the same team than the man who joins us today. Dirk, how you doing, man? You look good. Uh, I try to. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been, uh, yeah, I'm doing well, doing well. It's been, uh, it's been an interesting year. I've been traveling a lot and, you know, enjoying the kids and being home a lot more. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been fun. But now obviously we're going through these, these tough times and hopefully we'll, we'll get, get through this here soon. Yeah. What's it? Um, number one, everybody healthy. I mean, um, uh, you got three kids. You got Jessica. Everybody healthy. And how about how about family in Germany? Yeah. So uh, everybody's doing good. Thanks. Uh, it's been um, yeah. It's been a lot. It's been time of checking a lot on on friends and family. And I think it's it's brought actually everybody closer together. Um, so I've been been on the phone, a video conference, and um, almost every day. And uh, things are. Fortunately, looking uh, looking better in Germany. I think they're slowly trying to open up the country a little bit, step uh, step after step. So, but um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot, thinking a lot of, of people. You know, obviously fighting this virus on the front lines, all the medical people, and you know, and people that are affected, lost their job, lost family members. So, it's been uh, it's been a tough time. But uh, I'm trying to stay positive and, and and you know check up on friends and family a lot. Tell me what you've been trying to do to help. Oh, well, I have a, a foundation here in uh, in Dallas, and we uh, we gave a couple grants out. One to the North Texas Food Bank uh, that provides food to to families that uh, can't really feed their kids. You know, now that the school is off, um, the kids usually get their meals or their lunches at at school, and so now we uh, there's a big need, and we provided a big grant to the North Texas Food Bank, as well as to uh, to other. Um, uh, organizations that do good work here um so yeah just uh trying to help out and you know trying to stay active in the community obviously uh are you still taking the van out and getting it stuck in the mud yeah that was the <laughs> that was an interesting maneuver um you know actually the uh, wifey was out with the kids for a walk and uh, they they had the scooter so they 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 were quite far away so i picked them up and on the way back we drove by some street and I was like, hey, look at this little side street. Uh, this could be fun for the kids to drive through. It was a little muddy and it rained a few days. So I'm driving and I was like, oh, this is a little deeper than I thought here, these puddles. <laughs> and That's sure, a bad enough, feeling. <laughs> sure, sure enough, nothing forward, nothing backwards. I was just, my wheels were spinning. Um, so I had to remember that Darren Williams lives around the corner, lives in the neighborhood. I, I remember he had a big truck. So I called him, I said, do you well? I was like, hang with me here. This is a little weird, but can you come pick me up? And so he was, he was of course, laughing, and it, it, everybody got a good uh, good kick out of it. Yeah, in your mind, the biggest assist Darren Williams ever had in his entire <laughs> career. You, that, I, I, that is the worst I, feeling, though, man. When, you get, when you're behind the wheel and you get in a situation like this and there's no traction and you, you, you hit the gas a little bit and all you feel is that spin, you're done. Yeah, it was it was going nowhere here for a while. The good thing is we were kind of close to home. So wife and the kids walked home and I said, let, let me hear by myself with this thing and I'll figure it out. And it took about 30, 30 minutes or whatever for D-Well to come and, and get me out. So that was uh, that was good. Well, that was uh, that was good for you. Hey, you, you know, Charles Barkley uh, is so fond of telling the story about the first time he saw you. And he tells it so often, Dirk, that I don't really know what the real facts are because in one version, I hear you scored 25 in the first half and had 52 for the game. And then it was that 
he, that you were torching him and then it was that you were torching Scotty and then it was Scotty, so yeah. so this was so this was a Nike event where where was this number one so the, the Nike uh, brought a, a bunch of NBA players over for two games no actually three games one was in Paris and then two in Germany one was in Berlin and one was in Dortmund so we play we got to play against uh, these stars twice and yeah. uh, I'm not even sure which story, which game he's talking about, but I'm I'm usually <laughs> I'm enjoying talking about it. I'm not sure which one he's talking about. One time I did drive and and I dunked one, and you know it was sort of a loose game. Obviously they were there to promote the sport, the league. Yeah, but they it's were like having an exhibition. fun. Yeah, yeah, they were having fun. I mean they weren't really trying to you know clamp anybody down or whatever. So it was a, an up and down game. Jake Kidd was there. You know. It was lobs all over the place. They were you know, pushing the ball, and it was it was fun. So it was a very yeah. wide open game. And of course, they had a few jumpers and a few dunks on on the break. But I'm not even really sure how many points I scored. But it was it was fun, and you know I, that 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 part is true. That Charles came up to me and said after, "Hey, if you want to go to Auburn, um, you, I can get you in." Yeah. And I said. I'll pass on that. Thanks, though. I appreciate it. No, <laughs> you, no. Did you tell? Did you tell him you had to go? You had to have. You had to serve in the army, right? So I was in the army at the time, but I was my my um, my time was coming off a couple a couple weeks, a couple months later. So I knew I was ready to uh, to go to college. You know that that was my plan. I visited a few. Um, I visited Stanford, Kentucky, and Cal at the time. Um, and so I was thinking either go to college or stay in Europe. I visited uh, some teams in Barcelona and, and Italy. And so those were my choices. And NBA really wasn't on the radar until I, uh, I had that hoop, uh, hoop Summit game um, in San Antonio that day where, where the world select team plays against the best high school uh, guys. And um, then I had a good game there. And everybody said, hey, all of a sudden you're, you could be lottery picked. So that basically that one game changed my entire life you know i was looking back at that, that draft um because <clears throat> i was working the draft with hubie brown and i think rick majeris was on that with me and peter vesey craig sager uh, so we were covering that on tnt um but you weren't there right you were, were you in germany on draft night yeah so i was in germany i didn't go i wasn't quite sure how this is going to play out and like i said i wasn't 100 percent sure yet even if i was a lottery pick that I would come. I'm, I'm, I was super skinny. I was like 18, 19 years old. I just wasn't sure if my body was ready. So my thinking was I might not even get picked the lottery and then I'll, I can stay in, in Europe. I didn't have an agent, so I could have gone to college still. And so all, the, all those, those things were still in play. So were you watching it? In, were you, was there a way for you to watch it in Germany? No, actually, I think I worked out that night. You know my, my guy Holger that I used to work yeah. with all the time? So he lived yeah. like an hour away from me. So sometimes I would, we would work out in the evenings and I would stay in his, uh, in his house for, uh, for a few days, then drive back home. And so I don't actually think he had, we, it was on t TV in Germany that night. So I must've just yeah. got some rest had, after. Yeah, it would have yeah, had to have been, just, you know, in the middle of the night. Yeah, in the middle of the night, I think. So when did yeah. you find out you got drafted by the, uh, Top ten so the by next the morning, NBA team. I got yeah, I got up the next morning pretty early and, and Donnie and, and Nelly were calling on the phone and they were like, We drafted you, come on over. And we're like, Yeah, I'm not sure. So the Nel Nelson's boss were like, We're coming over there, we're not letting you slip away, we're coming to visit. <laughs> so sure enough, they came over and Rossboro Jr. was the owner at the time. He flew to my hometown with a little press conference together. And then uh, the two Nelson stayed with me, Don and Donnie, and uh, for a couple of days and watched me work out and, um, and met my family and all my, all my close ones and friends. And then they were like, hey, don't make a decision now. Come with us to Dallas. We fly you in. You can meet some of your teammates and then you'll make a decision. So I was like, okay. So they flew me over to Dallas. And I mean, it was amazing. I stayed at Nelly's house at, the, at that time. He threw a little barbecue for me. I met Steve. I met Mike. <laughs> I mean, it was it was a wrap. They were like, "Listen, we're a young team. We're we're fun. We're young. There's no pressure here. You can grow, and we can grow together." And you know, it took me uh, that whole night. I remember where I was sitting at the pool at Nelly's, and I'm doing a little list, pros and cons. Am I ready? And then I said, before I left, I was like, 
okay, guys, I'm gonna try this. If it, if it actually is really bad, I can always go back to Europe in two, three years after the rookie deal is over and things didn't work out. Um, so I, I decided to take that big step. And uh, uh, of course, at, at the time it was a very risky uh, choice, but uh, in, in the end, of course, it was the right decision. I know in the course of that first year, um, Nelly said at one point um, that um, Dirk, you know, they were taught that you didn't think you belonged. Is that accurate? That that there were times where you didn't think you, you belonged in in the NBA. So I'm uh, I'm not the most confident, uh, comfortable guy. I had some issues adjusting here, the speed of the game, um, the language barrier. Um, so it was it was hard for and. Like, you know, Ernie, the, my first year was a lockout year, 98, 99. So it was 50 games in a matter of, what, two and a half months. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, they were, we were all over the shop. We had back-to-back-to-backs uh, that year. And so everything was just overwhelming for me. And I just, I never really got any traction until all the way to the end of the year when Nelly was like, okay, now just try to get some confidence going. And uh, try to salvage, you know, you know, that the first season, and then I had some some good games. But yeah, com- I wasn't the most confident guy coming in. Uh, obviously, you had to do all the rookie duties, and you know, you you kind of like uh, you just the last guy on the roster. And uh, but you know, I try to work hard and and try to listen to Steve and Mike a lot, and they were great friends, great role models, and great mentors for me. And uh, you know, and just kind of worked, had to work my way through it. Who was your vet? Who and what was he making you do? So it's actually uh, I've had some great ones. I don't know if you remember that AC Green was in Dallas oh, yeah. at the time, yeah. who was like 38, but just a pro's pro. I mean, he was he was doing extra conditioning. He was running yeah. and Iron he, Man he, streak the whole bit. He, yeah, he had the streak going. I mean, he was the man. We had a Hot Rod Williams, uh, if you remember him. Yeah, uh, he had so many uh, defensive. Uh, things going. He was great teacher, and he always took me to the side. I hate to try this and this, and uh, and then Steve and Mike were there. Uh, the what were they stuff. making you do for the rookie treatment? Though? Oh, not was, bad. I mean, you know, I I used to like carry the bags or you know even donuts. We let, yeah, donuts. I landed in the middle of the night somewhere. It'll be freezing, and I'll be out there lugging the bags uh, <laughs> onto the bus, and uh, so and then. Robert Pack always made me bring his bag to his room every every night when we got in. Uh, he wanted his bag right away, and just just little things. It wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that bad. Uh, yeah, in in the course of your career, I mean, because I've, I've talked to players who said, yeah, that they made me do this and they made me do that, but I didn't make anybody else do that. Come clean now. So, who was your who was your who were some of your rookies? You know what? What you make them do? Yeah, actually, I was, I was once. I, I didn't love going through that phase of, of, you know, being everybody's guy that uh, they're just sent away to do stuff. So uh, later on, even in my career, I, I never really tried that much. And then honestly, the last, I don't know, ten years is kind of sort of phased out. You know, some older right. guys still, you know, guys still pick up chicken for the plane, or like I said, here and there some donuts, but. Really, it's uh, it's sort of phased out already. I remember was it Samaki Walker for me or something? They were like we'd have a shoot around and then okay, we're stretched now, and so everybody would come back to stretch and I had to get the balls and put it on the rack real quick. Well, Samaki would take the balls and toe punt them somewhere in the <laughs> second row in the stands, and I'll be like running around the whole stadium and get all the balls before it could stretch. And just little little fun stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, once once upon a time when when we did Wimbledon, I saw you uh, at the All England Club um, a few years into your into your career, um, and I was kind of surprised. I said, "What? That that looks like Dirk." And and mm-hmm. and later did I find out you were a pretty darn good tennis player once upon a time, weren't you, as a kid? Yeah. So I, tennis was actually my first sport. My my parents were like in a club, and it was like. It was a social event for them. You know, they would play a little bit doubles and then they would sit there and have some beers and talk to their friends. When meanwhile, we're there for like hours, uh, the kids, and we're just picked up rackets and, and started playing. So when I was about four or five years old, that was the first sport that I played. And, you know, I think actually it, it really helped me with, with footwork and hand-eye coordination. It's it's a great sport for uh, for, for kids to start with. So 
Uh, yeah, so I, I played. I played on tournaments. I was ranked in my area in Bavaria at the time. But then it was it was kind of hard, you know. You travel by yourself a lot, and you know, just with one parent. And, you know, the, the, all the tennis guys were sort of off on their own. And you know, I like to travel with the team. I like to have fun. I like to play cards with, yeah. with my teammates. I like to go through the, all the emotions with the team. And I wasn't. I just wasn't a guy that liked to be by himself all the time. Um, so eventually I kind of phased out tennis when I was like 13, 14, but still love it. Still do, sure. I do a tennis uh, fundraiser uh, for, my, for my foundation every year in September where we have pros come out and play. I play, uh, I try to play in the summer every other day. Um, I just go to big term. I've been to Wimbledon probably three times. Um, so I've, I still love tennis. I met Federer a couple of times. So I'm still a huge, huge tennis fan. Yeah, seven footer with that big, big kick serve, huh? I bet that's hey, tough, man. So, so I, serve and forehand is decent. The rest I'm trying to hide. You know, keep the points <laughs> short. Movement, movement, as you can think, is not very good, and the backhand is is not not very good. Hey, uh, tell me a little bit about Holger because uh, that's your relationship and what he meant to you in the development of your career <clears throat> certainly can't be overstated. Um, but I find it interesting because it wasn't just the basketball thing, man. It was like he wanted you well-rounded. He wanted you reading. He wanted you – is this where you picked up the sax because of him? Yeah, so he, he – I met him when I was about 15, 15 and a half. And, you know, first thing was always finish school. You don't, you don't know how basketball is going to play out. You know, you have to finish school. We're going to study every other day after practice, and you got to finish school. Um, and then you, he would push me in, in other areas, not just basketball. Of course, we would work out a lot. He would, uh, you know, make me better on the court, but also off the court. He would give me books. He would make me play music, uh, try to play piano and um, sax and the drums and guitar and, you know, all, all sorts of things. And just push me uh, in life uh, and, and become a better and more more rounded, well-rounded person, not only not only basketball player. And, and his methods at the time were, were strange and different and new, uh, but I, I was a kid and I enjoyed it. And I, I saw improvement pretty quick, but, you know, he had us running through uh, the gym and handstands and we were rowing for, for weightlifting. And we had a club guy play the saxophone during practice and we had to dribble to the <laughs> rhythm to it. And I mean, all of his methods were, were super, super different and weird. And so people, obviously, if something is different, people always think, oh, it's not going to work. So we took a lot of backlash there in, in Germany for a while. And people are like, They're, those guys are crazy. That's never going to work. And even when I left to the U.S. when I was 20, people were like, oh, he's, he's going to be right back in a year or two. And we had a lot of doubters there that that's going to work. But I always believed in him. And, um, you know, even – you know, my last two years, uh, I still was, was working with him all the time, trying to perfect things and work on things. And so we all worked with him basically my, my entire career. And we got so close. We, I mean, people are like, I was at this time, I was like 26, 27. We're traveling through Australia, we were backpacking. And, and people are like, you're 26 years old. Why are you going on vacation with a 65-year-old? <laughs> but, you know, it's just, I, I felt like I, I, he, I was a sponge. I learned so much from him. Yeah. And we talk about everything in, uh, in the world, and he was just super knowledgeable. So, yeah, he, uh, he was my mentor. I feel like everybody needs a mentor in, in their lives to get through tough times. And um, so he was mine, and he helped me a lot. Yeah, what was it? So, what was it like the first time that, uh, like, you introduced him to some of your Mavericks teammates? So, the first time he came to <laughs> Dallas to to kind of work with you, where the, the guys kind of looking, oh, this is a guy we heard of. I mean, had you told them about him before they met him? Uh, I can't even really remember how it was the first time, but actually, the first time when I came here, when the season, you know, I was still able to. I didn't sign my NBA contract when, because uh, the lockout came right after I was drafted. So I was still in Germany. I was working out. <clears throat> I was able to play for my German team, first division, all the way until the season was saved. Yeah. And then basically Donnie called and like, hey, you got to come in two days. You got to report. So I think the first time Holger came with me because I was like, I was super nervous to leave everything in the middle of the, of the se German season and pick everything 
and, and come over here and he helped me get an apartment and get settled. And so I think that his first couple of years, he was in and out a lot more than obviously once I was a little more established and then he, he'd come like maybe two or three times a year. But at the beginning, I mean, I'd, I'd call him like, hey, Holger, I cannot make a shot to save my life. Get on the plane. And he would literally two days, three days later, he'd show up. So I'd depend on him a lot my first couple of years, not only on the court, but also off the court, get, you know, get settled and, and get apartment, buy a car and, and all those little things. Yeah, I mean, that's a, people don't think about that a whole lot, Dirk, but, but that's a big thing. I mean, getting adjusted, I mean, if we tried to do the same thing, you think about it, say, okay, look, if I were going to, you know, go take a job in Germany, there would be a lot of things I would need to learn, including first the language and, but, but customs and how you do things. So, uh, I mean, like were people trying to get you to buy cowboy hats and cowboy boots and all that stuff too, in the, in the middle of how do you, how do you buy groceries here and how do you pay bills? Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was all challenging. You know, I, I grew up and was basically a little sheltered for my parents. My mom would do everything for me, wash and cook. And, and I had to do nothing at home, really. And so when I came here, everything was new to me. And sometimes I would go grocery shopping like after games because I knew it'll be quiet in there and I can just run through and, and get my things. And, you know, I didn't know how to write a check and uh, how to open up a bank account, how to get my driver's license. And, you know, I had no credit lines. I mean, all sorts of things that uh, were coming down at me. So I was kind of like overwhelmed a little bit. And and plus, like I said earlier, there was a little bit of a language barrier. You know, I learned English in school, but, you know, high school English, first of all. And then we learned Oxford English, you know, from England. So it had nothing to do when I come, came over here with the English <laughs> people spoke here. And so it was it was all a little overwhelming, even though, you know, obviously the Mavericks and, and, and the people in Dallas try to make me feel comfortable and welcome as much as they can. And I will always remember I, I landed with the two Nelsons from the flight from, from Frankfurt. I come off the plane and there was like hundreds of people with signs and stuff. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. You know, these, these people are excited I'm here and they're, you know, they, they want me to succeed. And then later on, like two months later, I found out they were all Mavs employees. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the owner had made them go out there and hold the signs. And here I thought, this is really cool. You know, all these fans are coming to see me. No, they were all, the whole mass front office was there. Well, but anyways, it, it was, it was a fun time. It wouldn't take long before uh, they didn't have to force employees to go root for you because, because it all worked out so well. And I, no, I you know, it. I know there were expectations too. And, and you probably heard the, well, the, you know, the Larry Bird comparison, you know, the, well, here's a seven foot or six ten, six eleven, seven foot, a guy with touch, you know, the white guy with touch, and he's Larry Bird, the second coming. <laughs> Did you hear all that stuff? Yeah, of course. Uh, I heard it, and I, I just had to, you know, take it as an honor and, you know, be compared to one of them all-time greats. But it also, I want to do, you know, what I can do best, and I'm I'm not Larry Bird. I wanted to, to obviously get better and, and make it in this league with what I do and, and my skill set and, you know, uh, so it was hard. And then, you know, I, I don't know if you remember Paul Pierce was drafted right behind me from Boston. So when, when he all of a sudden took off his first year right away, played great, and I was starting slower. So then obviously that came up and we got compared every other day in the newspaper you know, comparison. Paul Pierce is doing that. and Dirk is doing nothing. And so that put pressure and, you know, the Larry Bird thing. And then Nelly said I could be rookie, rookie of the year, I think, in the lockout one time. Must have been sort of in January, oh no, in, in December. I came over and looked for an apartment while, and, and the guys would meet and scrimmage a little bit. And so one day, I just had a lucky day and I threw everything in. And I, so Nelly saw, I guess, must have saw that on the video or something. And he came out saying, Dirksen might be rookie of the year. Well, so that added, for that. An, that, that <laughs> added another whole pressure thing. So. I was a little overwhelmed my first year, but you know what? I, I just try to work my, my way through it. You know, I said, um, I went in the gym early at night. I went back with Nash. He played one-on-one, -on -one, played horse, played, played all sorts of things and, and always try to work on my game. And then, and that's how you, how I got through tough times is by, by trying to improve, trying to get better and never really settle, never be satisfied. So when you win MVP, when, when you're the MVP, 
of the NBA, um, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? And what I mean, what is the most satisfying part of that? Um, so you, you're when, talking about the league MVP? Yeah, league MVP. Because that uh, that is obviously, I always look back at that season with a smile, but also with a crying eye. Because you know we won 67 games, and then we were the first team to lose uh, to an eight seed, uh, which was the Golden State at the time. So uh, what an amazing year we had. Actually, people don't remember much, but we, we started that season off 0-4 and, and went 67 and 11 to close the season, which is obviously unheard of. We had an amazing year. Uh, we felt like we, we were the heavy favorites, and then we ran into a Golden State team that was hot at the right time. They were a huge matchup problem for, for us with a bunch of small guys, athletic shooters, playmakers. And then obviously they were coached by Nelly, who knew our system perfectly. He knew how to play me. You know, he would, he would make me spin. As soon as I spun, there was another guy there trapping me, and I was all over the place with the ball. So they, they had a perfect game plan. They were hot. And so we, we lost I bet you, the first I round. bet you could just hear – I bet you could just hear – Nelly in their practices saying, here's what you want to do. And then when he for said, sure. uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He, he had our game down. And so he knew our weaknesses and he exploited them tremendously. And, and so I always look back at that MVP season with, with, with pride and, and that the team we had with, with, with coach Avery and we had a blast going through that season and then coming such to an abrupt end. I remember I was so frustrated. I was almost embarrassed, you know, after the year we had to let the, let the team down, let the franchise, to let the city down if you want. And so I didn't really want to leave my house much. And, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was a tough, tough time for me. And so uh, my first thought was, I want to get out of here. I want to leave for Germany. I want to leave. That's actually the summer. We, we went to Australia. I was like, I want to get as far away as possible. I want to travel. And, and so the NBA had called and say, now we can't confirm, but there is a chance that Dirk is winning the MVP. So he's got to stay in the country. And I'm like, oh, no. So I was like, I don't even want it. I mean, give it to somebody else. This is so embarrassing. So, wow. So uh, I stayed, I, they had me wait and wait, because usually the, you get the, somewhere during the second round, you, the, they present the MVP, and it's usually right. at halftime or before a game. Well, our yeah. game was, was over, so I had a press conference with, with David Stern and Mark at the time, and it was, I remember just being super embarrassed about this, about getting this super, super special trophy and not being able to make it to the second round. So that was, that was a, a great time in my life, but also one that I will always look back at and, and, uh, and, and be sad and, and disappointed. The 2011, man, that uh, all that disappointment fades because you, you get there and, and you're the finals MVP. And uh, you, you talk about the importance, how, how much you love team sports and being able to share with teammates. It, it just doesn't, it just doesn't get any better than that. And so, and so when that final horn went off and, you guys had the Larry O'Brien Trophy. Um, what are what is that moment like? You know, I think, you know, everybody saw the pictures of me jumping over the scores table and, and running to the locker room as soon as the horn sounded. I just, I needed a few moments away. You know, if you try for something so hard and so long, every year you lose in the playoffs, there's disappointment. Uh, you didn't reach your goal. And, uh, you're disappointed, you're heartbroken, and then that pushes you to work harder. And, and so I, I just needed a moment. I went in the locker room there in Miami. I laid in the shower. There was a little bench, and I just had to be by myself for a couple of minutes. And things go through your mind, you know, who, who helped you, who, who, who was on your side, who was against you, all the hard work you put in. And, and you know, and all the disappointments come up in, in the playoffs before. And, you know, I always, I always say, you know, 06 was super tough when we lost to Miami in the finals, being up 2-0. Uh, 07 was when we, my MVP year, we lost in the first round. So all these moments were super, super hard to go through and, and, and heartbreaking. But at the end of the day, I think it made me, you know, the player I was in 2011. It made me the closer. It made me, you know, the... Uh, the tough minded player I needed to be to, to carry us through the, the playoffs. And so that's going through your mind, all the work, all the disappointments before and all the people that helped you get there. So it was, 
it was just the, the greatest feeling to after all these 10 plus years of, of hard work you put in that finally you're you're at the mountaintop it's just it's the best and especially with that team that we had with with a bunch of older guys that had no egos and loved playing with each other loved being around each other it was it was the ultimate for sure um you can be an emotional guy um in your last your last season the tributes you know san antonio was uh, was touching to you i know that that kind of got you right there but also the the night when charles is there and larry bird is there and rick carlisle's kind of the mc and he's working the mic and he's giving it to these guys <laughs> but 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 i look at that and i think here's the guy who nelly said doesn't know if he belongs and now he's got Larry Bird looking at him and saying, you know what, you left the game better than when you got into it. Um, wow, Dirk. Yeah, un unbelievable. I mean, you know, obviously when I first got here, I didn't know where this would take me. So it's been an amazing, amazing ride, amazing journey uh, with so many people that, that helped along the way. And, um, that lad last home game, I will never forget, uh, you know, for, for five of my idols with Sean Kemp and Death of Tourette uh, coming and, and uh, Scotty Pippen, who who, uh, who was one of my idols. Uh, I loved MJ, who's obviously the GOAT, but then Pippen was right there because uh, I was a huge Bulls fan in the 90s. And for, for these five guys to show up and show respect towards me and my career, what I've done, that's uh, that was super overwhelming for me and it meant so much i can i can't even describe it so that that whole the last couple of days of, of my career i'll never forget with with the uh, tribute video they played for me before the san antonio game and um you know it was just everything i've ever dreamed of and uh, I'll, I'll never forget i got the I, I just get the impression that if you're sitting in the living room with jessica and you guys are watching a movie, it wouldn't be out of the question for you to be dabbing a tear every now and then. Do you cry at movies, Dirk? Uh, I am a little emotional at times. Uh, I, if there's a cool movie or it's a really sad part, I, I do get a little tear in my eye. And then, of course, <laughs> I try to play it off to wife. You know, just, <laughs> yeah, you know that. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm drinking something. I'm kind of like wiping my eyes at the same time. So, yeah. Um, I'm a little emotional at times, uh, but it's um, that's that's part of who I am. Yeah, as and, and having kids kind of taps into that too. I mean, there's nothing like, you know, you look at uh, your three kids right now, and the oldest is what seven, and you're um, watching this all happen, and you're being, and now you're retired, and you're a central figure in this. You know, it's not, hey, I, I'm not around. You know, how are the kids? You're right there. Yeah, it's been a special time. You know, that's something I look forward to. I, uh, the last few years, with my ankle being, you know, struggling, and it took a little bit of the fun away. So I was looking forward to to being home and enjoying the kids and dropping them off at school every day, picking them up, and uh, and all that fun stuff. So I've been, it's been, it's been everything I ever dreamed of. And like I mentioned earlier, we traveled so much. I'm, I wanted them to see different cultures, different foods, and uh different different languages here and and so we've we've been on the go a lot last summer and then over christmas and and, and seeing family all over the world and uh it's it's been a blast it's been a blast with with the kids and so i can't wait to to spend even more time with them and show them show them even more last couple of things mark cuban recently said that if you were playing in your prime with luca that's MJ and Scotty all over again. Ah, uh, that's a little far fetched, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I grew up in the '90s. Uh, that was my era. Uh, I watched the Bulls all the time. Uh, for me, Michael Jordan will always be the, the goat. Uh, always, I don't care who comes along. Yeah, and, and Pippen was just the, the perfect all-around player for me. There was nothing on the court that that he couldn't do. You know, whether it's defend, push the ball up, post up, I mean, pass him. He, he was plugging all sorts of holes defensively. He was he was a, one of the best all-around players this league has probably ever seen on this position. So I was a huge, huge fan. And, and to put us in that category, I would, I would never even go near that. Uh, do you ever – are you familiar with uh, this video series called The Game of Zones? 
which is a takeoff on the Game of Thrones. Have you I seen have it? seen I have seen our uh, our video, which I thought was super funny. But I'll I'll, I'll let you explain. <laughs> no, no, because because we did. I wanted to play just like a minute's worth for you, just to get your reaction to uh, the visit by Kristaps Porzingis and Luca. <laughs> Here, yes. here, here it comes. Bozen, in the name of Dirk Nowitzki of House Mavericks, I hereby declare you the next Dirk. Okay, wait, hold on. With all due respect, you, do, you said I was the next Dirk, like like a moon ago. Oh, f <laughs> that's right, okay. <laughs> that's she right. Stops. <laughs> you will be the next Dirk until Luca comes of age. Right, but I'm already the, the go-to knight, right? I'm scoring roughly 20 points a battle. <laughs> what if uh, maybe both of you are the next Dirk? We do double Dirks. Yeah, it could be double Dirks. <laughs> Want to be triple Dirks? Want to be triple Dirks? Triple Dirks? Who is the other? I, th I think I also told uh, Maxi Klebers that he's the next to me. Uh, sir, our next battle starts in eight hours. We need to start your stretches. <laughs> oh, so don't. thank you, JJ. I'll be right there. All right, boys. <laughs> Time to play some basketball. <laughs> oh, that is good. Oh, I love those guys that. are brilliant. I, I, have, I have seen that one, and that was that was fine, fine work. We, I actually the whole team enjoyed that, so they I got plenty of uh, of flack for that one. Uh, hey, uh, I'm sure that you're watching. Are you watching, Michael? Are you watching the uh, the, the Last Dance? What? I was looking forward to that for, for yeah. weeks, and it was everything I hoped for uh, the first two episodes last night. And just learning more about MJ and his competitive fire, about his family, and then, of course, Scotty, who I loved, was an equipment manager in, uh, in high school or whatever I was uh, yeah. I heard. So just amazing, amazing stories. And, you know, like I said, I was a, a diehard Bulls fan. And some of the stuff I, I didn't even remember anymore that, you know, that Pippen kind of held out and demanded for a trade and all that stuff. It's just, uh, it's, it's great. And I can't wait, I can't wait to, I could have probably binge watched the whole 10 in a row last night. That's how fired up. I couldn't sleep afterwards watching some of these highlights of MJ scoring 63 on, on, uh, in the garden. And, against Boston and just uh just I was I was so hyped it was uh, just it was taking me back to to my childhood in the 90s for sure yeah um uh, Dirk man it's good to catch up with you and uh and I really appreciate how gracious you've been with your time thank you so much for that and um good luck in retirement and Thanks, um and being a a husband and a dad and um and as as I've told you before you've been uh um nothing but uh a a a, a tribute to this league uh through wow, 21 years all with the dallas mavericks so uh thank you much and uh and i appreciate safe, it right? thanks thanks for having us uh, having me and tell the boys i said hello in uh when you see them and uh, i miss i miss you guys i miss being around so this is definitely tough but i'll always be around the game and i hope to run into you uh, or you guys soon it would be our pleasure thank you dirk Thanks, EJ. Thanks, man.